Okay, guys, we're here with Dr. An and Janice, one of our favorite patients who just got her new implant overdenture. And Janice, could you pop that out for us to take a look at? So these are on the upper. Nice nails, Janice, I like them. Good, and can you show us that there? Nice, so it's U-shaped, there's no palette, not like this denture over here. Traditional denture, which we have given Janice as a backup, but the advantages here are that there is no palate, doesn't cover the roof of the mouth, snaps into place, and you can pop it back in for us, Janice. Awesome. And what are you gonna have for your first meal with your new implant uh, denture? Nachos? Pizza. Pizza? I like that too. <laughs> All right, thanks, Janice. Oh no, it's the Wicked Witch of Dental Insurance. I'm gonna reduce all of your fees. But it costs more to run a practice. I don't care. <laughs> oh no, it's the... Hey you guys, this is Paul, Dr. Nacho Goodman. I'm here in my office in Pennington, New Jersey. I've been a dentist here since 2004, associate to owner. Uh, one of my favorite places to be. Also, one of the more intense places to be. That's why I call stress intensity. Doing dentistry each day is like doing full contact arts and crafts on people who don't want to be here. Or sometimes I describe it as like producing a Broadway play that nobody wants to see. But we get to do cool things like help people chew and smile with confidence, be part of a team. But there's so many moving parts and pieces that go on behind the scenes in your dental circus. I mean practice, I mean circus. And one of the things my team asked me to do was to make a video on what to say, some talking points on what to say when we are shifting status as we are right now with one of our in-network insurance plans. So we're not dropping it. No one's dropping anything on the floor like those lounge. I did not that one say, what else do we have in the box? It's a mangled pedo ring and you say, perfect. That will have to do and you have to keep your crying on the inside, but that's clinical dentistry. Let's stick with the insurance part. So patient calls up, says, do you take my insurance? Do you participate with my insurance? Do you accept my insurance? So I want to bring this up here. What do we say when that happens? So someone calls you up, it's not easy to be on the phone. There's phone calls, there's patients. Someone says, do you accept my insurance? Spoiled Guac PPO, and here's how we start. That's a great question. A lot of patients ask us that. When you say that's a great question, I would wanna know that too. That's a great question. A lot of patients ask us that. It just pauses your mind for a minute and lets you think. It lets the patient know that what they're asking is totally normal. But now you're gonna start digging deeper. So what's the next thing you're gonna say after he says, do you accept my insurance? Spoiled guac PPO. What you're gonna say is, let's take a look here. Next thing I wanna say is, here it is. Dental insurance works a lot like a coupon. A coupon that has blackout dates, a benefit that has blackout dates. Whatever insurance plan that you utilize, we're gonna do the best job possible to maximize the benefits of your coupon. Now notice I haven't mentioned their specific plans, Bully Block PPO. So you're gonna say, that's a great question. A lot of patients ask them. If you would like that whole video, feel free to just text in for it. I can't wait to bring up my co-stars for tonight's episode, Dr. Travis Campbell and Dr. Todd Fleischman. They are welcome to come up to the post-op check-in. They can start their video whenever they are ready. There's Dr. Todd Fleischman, Dr. Travis Campbell. I also have one of my awesome Nacho team members here. I do want to share if you're watching this live, it is an embarrassment of sports success here in Philadelphia. Currently, the Eagles are undefeated. The Philadelphia Phillies are going to the World Series. And behind me, we have uh, Rocky Three, Rocky versus Mr. T, a classic Rocky just think of that as Todd Fleischman versus Travis Campbell, PPO versus fee-for-service dentistry. So, so glad everyone's here. This is going to be a fun, uh, Travis said it was okay if we did three hours. So fun three hours of time uh, till, uh, well, no, just 60 minutes of time for you guys to ask questions, learn from us. This is our postdoc check-in from our course. People who bought the recordings are here. I see like, uh, I don't want to violate Zoom HIPAA, but I see my friend from Maryland part of our Job Connect program for the second time. I see my friend who was just at the Small Fast course. I see my Denver friend and a lot of other people here in the chat, which is awesome. I see my new practice owner friend from Texas here. 
So let's just I always like to orient people as to who we are and what we do. So Travis, just orient yourself in case this audience has seen you for the first time, just a little bit about your dental background, practice owner, family life. Give us a few minutes of Travis. Let's see. I'm weird. I've always wanted to be a dentist. Uh, I graduated 14 years ago, started practice from scratch and dental insurance annoyed me enough and couldn't find any answers. I looked for myself and started educating people once I started getting asked the questions. Um, wrote a couple books, have an online training platform for insurance. So I'm that's what I do. Dental insurance and practice management. You deliver so much value, Travis, we dig into it. But if you would like to get 24-7 help from Travis, you can text Travis to 215-798-9897. He has an amazing monthly membership program. Travis, you like my cup though. Not weird. Just be kind, be bold, be you, be unique. You're not, you're, you're unique, not weird. That's my word choice. Dr. Fair enough. Uh, I like them both. Dr. Todd, uh, who's just down a few blocks away from me as we record this, tell the audience about yourself, Todd. Uh, great to be here. I just want to mention that the Philadelphia Union, also the oh, yeah. Major League Soccer team, is in the Eastern Conference Finals on Sunday, nice. and they get they get no respect. <laughs> you know, so I just well, want to make a point. Give a shout out. Yes, of course. Um, I'm Todd Fleischman. I've been practicing in Center City, Philly, as a fee for service dentist in my own practice since I bought it in 2010. I raised two kids, ten and eight, here in town. Um, and, you know, it's a constant a grind, of course, uh, but we, we are trying to find on a daily basis the things that make us happiest and focus on them as much as we can, you know, in our businesses, which can be challenging, um, but something that uh, we try and manage as much as possible. Like that, Todd. So it's, it's a myth that fee-for-service dentists like to show me the money. They don't just run in and throw money at you as a fee-for-service dentist. You still have to talk about Not yet. insurance. Not yet. Not yet. Not um, yet. And I'm Dr. Paul Grimm. I have two practices. Lucky to work with my brother. Uh, family practice. We have multiple specialists. And as of January 1st this year, we're out of network with insurance. I call myself out of network. I call Todd Fee for service. I say Travis is uh, into PPOs. I don't know if he loves them. He said he liked, likes them. He's not sure if he wants to ask him to prom or not yet, but he like, likes PPOs. And uh, that you can ask us about our practice at all. So we are here. To, I have plenty of questions that have been submitted that we can go through, but for the people who came to Zoom, it is your time to ask whatever you would like. It's best, just so everyone knows, this is not my first Zoom rodeo. I don't know if anyone's heard of the pandemic, but I've spent thousands of hours on the Zoom. It's easiest if you submit it through the q and I have Miles and Nacho team member here helping us. But let's just start off with this. And if it doesn't affect you directly in your practice, you could still give an answer, but I'll ask Travis this. Are membership clubs a good idea? What is a membership club, Travis, and is it a good idea? So membership clubs are basically an office's internal way of creating a plan similar to insurance. Just you don't have to deal with all the other junk that comes with insurance. So I think membership clubs are a great idea. You just got to make sure you do them well. Um, you know, the one. How, how have you seen Dennis make errors with doing? How have you seen them make errors with their membership clubs? Making them far too cheap. I mean, I've seen a membership club for $150 a year that was two hygiene visits. I'm like, that's $75 a visit. That's not worth doing. It just is, isn't. You're actually worse off than insurance at that point. But other than that, most people set them up fairly well and patients like them. And, you know, if you have cash patients, it's a great way to get people to feel like they have a plan. And all the statistics show if they have a plan of any kind, patients will spend more money. I like that, Travis. I'll add in that one of my biggest regrets in life, I don't know why people say I don't have regrets. I got plenty of regrets. I had a George Clooney haircut, big regret in college, looks stupid. My parents were right. It was a ridiculous haircut. Uh, my, one of my biggest regrets as a dental practice owner is not embracing them sooner. I didn't pay attention to them early enough. We were up to, I think, close to 300 people on our membership club. Whether you DIY it, whether you get a company to do it, I did put here, if you text club to this number, we can send you back nacho sponsors that do that. I know Todd isn't super familiar with it. I do want to ask his, his thoughts on it in a second. But Travis, do you use a service or do you DIY it? I use a service. I DIY'd it for a few years, but service just makes it a lot easier. Now, for the dentist out there who sometimes, what's the word for it, are a little bit dentist cheap. They're not making their own bite rooms, right? They're not, they're not at their lab at night making bite rooms. But they go, I could just write everybody on a piece of paper 
where does the DIY it become a business challenge? Um, well, it depends on your team, but I would say it starts to become any amount of work at the first time you do it. I'd say it starts to become exponential amounts of work once you have about 50 members. The trackability of it, the goal is for people mm -hmm. to renew. Now we have people just renewing the way ours work is. These are not our real fees. But let's say hygiene visits, x-rays, exams, and the emergency visits is like a list cost of $800. They immediately get $300 off, $500 for hygiene, and they get 10% off every other service. And they really seem to like that 10% when they come for implants, mm -hmm. crowns, and things like that. Todd, I know you haven't embraced the membership club first, but I know maybe your friends have. What are your thoughts on the membership club in general? Yeah, I'm pro. I mean, I, it totally doesn't seem like there's a down, much downside to it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, in my practice, I, I haven't felt a need for it, um, a need to, whether you want to call it a discount, a coupon or something of that off of your, you know, you know sort of cash fee. I haven't felt the need to do that uh, at this moment, but I could certainly see there being tons of value in it. And you do without, you don't, know, but you, I really, and I admire this, you have a really attractive and i talked about this all through the streets of philadelphia to the people who park my cars to the you know people who I work out at the gym i say todd fleischman has one of the best new patient experiences and i don't call it a special but i say you're giving a really great deal on it maybe just tell your tell the audience while you might not do a, a membership club you do find value in giving a really awesome new patient experience and deal as a fee-for-service dentist tell us about that yeah. I mean, besides that, I'm also very conscious of like the experience patients are having and the value I provide. So like we discount fluoride, we show other areas, but in, in particular for the new patient experience, you know, they're spending an hour with me for a comprehensive evaluation, a full set of x-rays, and then a separate second hour with the hygienist, um, you know, doing all the diagnostic stuff that you would do comprehensively, like any office would. You know, when you tally that up, it's almost $600 to services as a cash a la carte uh, fee. I bring people in at, at $295 right now. We do raise it every year. Um, I started out at $95. I think that was, you know, back in 2012 or something like that when I started doing it. Um, and that was to get people in the practice, to make it attractive for them to start coming. And then once they get a feel for the type of care we're providing or the level of service we're providing or just the vibe that we have in the practice, um, then, then typically they're, it's hard for them to leave. Right. And that's the reality of it. And, and they also find that there's a ton of value. I'm still submitting their insurance benefits. The first visit they often get paid back more than what I actually charge them out of pocket. And so they start to see that there is still value coming to a fee for service office without having to be, I'm um, so put off by a lack of benefit. Yeah. I like that. You know, it's, fee for service doesn't have to mean most expensive. It's just how you money works Correct. in practice. Um, so I'll start with Todd first. Let's say people were asking Todd after your awesome presentation, if you could be their consultant. So let's say Dennis comes to you and say, hey, Todd, I've been in network for a decade. I want to go fee for service. What's one thing I should do first? I'm going to ask Travis next. What's something I should think about doing first? You know, listen, I, and I admit this wholeheartedly, I never went from insurance driven to fee for service. So I, 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 I think that answer is going to be different for everybody. For me, I feel like the reason I can sustain fee-for-service, and I know this sounds sort of cliche, but it is the relationships that I build. And so I think that you need to understand who your patient base is. Is this a patient base who seems committed to you because of what you're providing as a dentist? And if you make that switch, are you willing to deal with the attrition that comes with maybe the, the relationships that aren't quite as, as yeah. solid as you thought they were? I, so I think you need to evaluate relationships. Maybe that's the answer, I like um, that. but I, but I don't really know. I don't really know where to start except for building it big enough to feel comfortable that when you lose some size that you can make it through. That's the reality. I like that. Travis, how about you? I'd say figure out your why. And here's the challenge most dentists have. Most of us have a why that affects us and the practice, but doesn't resonate with the patient at all. Like, you know, if your why is that you get your fees are too low, well, the patient's not going to appreciate that. They like the fees being low. So you've got to find out why that the patient can resonate with so that when you discuss it with them, you have a legitimate reason that they can latch on to and go, okay, I can appreciate that. I'll stick with you. So but it's like everything in life. It's all about the why. I like that too. My, my contribution would be two parts. One would be to market more well before mm -hmm. doing it. Market more 
uh, with the plus sign of market more for services that you enjoy doing that aren't really tied to insurance. For me, that would be dental implants. For someone like Todd, that might be comprehensive, full mouth, the crowns and veneers. Travis, I know you're now on the implant uh, train with me. We got to get our train conductor hats for our implant train. But whether that's yeah, whether that's clear liners, whether that's I do want to share kind of you know just an example. All of us, whether we have insurance or not, are doing fee for service things daily because there's things that aren't covered by insurance. We have um, a company that sponsor notches evenly that does clear liners in our practice. And they basically come and they do these great consults and we get 60 to 80% case acceptance that day for those services that aren't covered by insurance because people want them. They want their teeth to be straighter. They're treating themselves after the pandemic. I mean, Todd, have you seen people treating themselves after the pandemic in ways that they might not have before? Totally. I mean, it's definitely out there. You have to always joke with patients when they talk to me, oh, you know, just put money into my house. I just went on vacation. I go, yeah, we're all fighting for discretionary dollars, right? Yeah. We always joke about that in the practice. We're all fighting for it. I'm across the street from the Apple store. No one seems to have any problems buying the Note 14 Pro, you yeah. know? So, you know, we all take umbrage with that, right? But you have to value yourself as much as people value iPhones, right? You have to mm -hmm. bring to the table what you have to offer. I mean, there is commitment to that. That comes with confidence. That comes with time. You know, it's hard as a young dentist to understand these things, but you realize it over time when you build a practice and you have to have these conversations with people about them having to decide, you know, do they want uh, the white name to be you hear me, Morgan? The even you lose me, Morgan? No, you're on. Hello. Did you lose us, Paul? Maybe I lose you, lost Morgan? us. You guys still on? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, did we lose Todd or me? No, you. <laughs> oh, me. Sorry. Keep going then. Oh, I'll, uh, I got more than the post. You lose me that. It was. It was no lose. big deal. I lost my train of thought. My point. My whatever my point was. I think it was a good one. So it's. it's, it's <laughs> if you lose, you can keep going. Um, anyone here in the Zoom can ask their own questions here for the expert of insurance, Travis, fee for service, Todd, or me. But this has been a consistent question, um, Travis you do consulting, right? And people say, mm -hmm. I want to bring on an insurance an associate. And I want them to take insurances. I don't take. What do you have to say to that? How does that work? Usually what kind of advice would you give them? I would say the most difficult way to work with insurance is to have participation with one provider and non-participation with another. It can be done. Um, it's just very hard. I mean, now you've got to treat both dentists completely separately. The team has to treat estimates completely separately. I think it's just, it makes it really difficult to be, you know, one in, one out. Um, so, but again, it depends on what you want to do. Is your team okay with that challenge? Do, is your patient base one that you can do that? Is the dentist who's not in network trying to retire, get out, sell, whatever. And so he's intentionally trying to reduce his patient load. I mean, there's lots of reasons for it. Um, I think just it's just a lot more work versus, you know, being all in or all out with whichever number of insurance companies you want, um, I think works out a lot better because then doctors don't have to be, you know, you, you can see either doctor and it doesn't matter. I, I agree with you. Je Todd knows my brother, Jeff. Well, when he first came to the practice, we got him in network with insurance, other insurances thinking this would be great. It caused so much confusion. It caused angry patients. It caused conflict. I would not do it again. I was sometimes tiptoeing. Can I do this exam? Does Jeff have to do this exam? What to tell the patient? I think it's a thought that becomes just confusing to the patient and mm -hmm. anything that confuses them usually causes conflict inside of your office. Uh, whether it's uh, how they pay for care, whether it's how their hygiene is just scheduled. So um, good. We got a QA. and a We did. I see. I got new practice owners here. I know these people for their boost. Here he is. Good. New practice owner from boost. I went fee for service day one in an acquisition where the selling doc was only a network with Delta Premier, but he allowed people not to pay that day. I'm six months in. And I still see people for the first time that can't believe we asked for payment. My struggle is so we tell them on the phone tell them that day when they sit down, it seems like a touchy subject. I actually want Todd to share because I always admire this about his office. How do you manage people's expectations for paying when they come in, Todd? It might be simple to you, but the other practices it's not. And we just tell them on the phone. <laughs> I mean, we're very transparent. That's a hot button for me. I don't want any surreptitious behavior 
on the phone with my team, you know, about what things cost. And, and so people know when they come to our practice, uh, the first thing they ask us, of course, on the phone is do you take our insurance? And we answer, no, <laughs> we don't say yes. And that we have some weird, you know, sort of sideways answer. We say, no, we don't directly participate, but we're happy to do the paperwork for you. How insurance works is typically like this, right? You know, you can go through some of the spiel, but we quote them a la carte fees, you know, and if people call fee hunting, I'm happy to have my team tell them, but we give them ranges and we don't commit to anything, of course. Right. And so that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing, you know, getting people to pay. It's just a matter of having your team trained well and asking for it at time of service and not budging. And yeah, you're going to turn some people off and you could have agreements with those people. My solution to that would be, okay, Mrs. Smith, I understand you're not used to paying a time of service. Dr. Smith, this new doctor understands that. And he really respects the relationship you have with Dr. Jones for today. We're happy to be balanced bill you, but pushing forward, we expect your payment at time of service. I mean, you can give them a, you know, you have to be flexible, right? Yeah. You're a new owner. You don't want to be turning people off. You're not looking to make huge changes, but you can set precedents and expectations like Travis and I talk about with all the patients, right? That doesn't change. And so that's really what you should be doing as you're transitioning this practice. Because some people are care and most aren't going to, right? But the ones who care are going to be the loudest squawkers yeah. and it makes your life the most miserable. That's how it goes. I, I really like that. I, you know, it's, I was going to share, share that, like what you let people get away with. If you look at worst case scenario, someone comes in for a hygiene visit and never pays. It's much different as Travis was on the group today with someone coming in for a crown and never paying and then coming in for an implant and implant crown and they're paying. So you're minimizing your risk. Travis, anything to add to that about a new practice owner struggling in network with one insurance and patients aren't used to paying? So anytime you make a change, like Todd said, people are going to complain about it. It doesn't matter what that change is. <laughs> the, sure. the big thing about it is just form, form your goals, have, give your team you know, training on and role play on how to answer the questions that are going to come up. You know, they are, they're probably going to come up daily when you're changing something about money or insurance um, and just be prepared for them. And like you said, be flexible. I, I'm a huge fan of, you know, if a patient's going to cause a fuss, it's not worth the fuss, just give them something, but, you know, eventually lead them to where you want them to go. Um, I mean, we actually in network, we require patients to pay it to time of scheduling. So, I mean, did we get a lot of pushback from that? Oh, yeah, we got a decent amount of pushback. Did we lose any patient support? Not really. Um, people just complained and then realized, well, I'm gonna have to pay the money anyway. So it doesn't matter if I pay this week or next week. No. Um, so whatever. I mean, but our, our collections rate went up to almost hundred percent and we are, uh, cancellation rate dropped to almost zero. I mean, it just, it works. So people will follow their money wherever they end up putting it. And I think what you guys both added great value in me, you know, a decade and a half into owning a practice, be flexible, give people a chance with hygiene and people who cause problems about money up front tend to be very difficult patients forever. They're never, they're and they never, will be the, yeah. they'll be the ones who cause you problems after the fact too. So don't yeah. expect that just by allowing them to pay after the fact, they're going to pay. No, they're not. If they're going to give you problems now. They're going to give you problems later. And I mean, sometimes I just say to people, I mean, I do it inside and outside of my dental life. Say, you know, does that seem reasonable to you? You know, we're going to do this procedure. We have our specialist coming in to, to, to schedule an appointment. It's going to be half of the, half of the cost down He's come he or she's coming in. Does that sound reasonable? And people who don't, and, and now there's, I mean, I'll, I'll, let's just run through this because it's a good question. Travis, I have a $2,000 cost in your office. I can pay with check. I can pay with cash. I can pay with credit card. What other financing options do you have? Um, I mean, we, if people push, we allow them to do half down now and half at the day of the appointment. Um, we do have third-party financing. Um, we do have in-office financing, but they have to sign and pay their down payment ahead of time. Um, I mean, we have a million different ways to pay us. I mean, that's the thing is I'll take your money no matter how you want to give it to me, um, as long as you give it to me on time. That's that's the big thing. Right. And Todd, I've seen some of your amazing cases. People have a $30,000 case. What are ways that they can take care of that and still be on the TAF team with your expectations? 
Yeah. I mean, it's nice to know ahead of time whether or not someone's going to use a third party and get hit 10% on it, to be honest with you. You know, I mean, it would be nice to know those things. You know, I try and just go about my business and whatever it is, what it is. If they have to use third party, then we let them. And, you know, I, I just consider it a case to your margins are just a little slightly less, right? And, and you just get more experience and, and you market it as much as you can. Um, but typically they're paying with a credit card, you know, to, to hold the appointment for a big, big case. They're putting at least a third down. Um, so they're already committed before they even walk in the door of a significant portion day of prep, at least another third, if not the rest of it, typically the rest of it, they're usually paid in full prior to the third, you know, prior to their insert visit. That's almost just across the board. We very rarely deviate from that unless there's already a financial arrangement. The biggest thing now, quite honestly, that I'm contemplating, and this I'd be interested in both of your opinions and the audience is, you know, whether or not to charge back the credit card fee, because talked about today, I'm, today. I'm taking incredible hits on credit cards incredible hits, you know, um, giving people 5% time of service, right? They pay the entire thing. Then I'm taking at least a 2% hit on top of that. So for most of my cases, care credit or not, I'm taking almost a 7% hit. Well, what, and that's interesting. Is I, I want to, we just, one of my sponsors helps with credit card processing um, reduction. And we just had a zoom with them today. And our, one of our team members said, that's what they did to me for daycare. They said, your daycare every week, is $800 if you pay by check and it's, you know, $824 if you pay by credit card. And she said, wow, 50 weeks a year at 24 bucks is $1,000. I want to share for the people catching up because I'm so thrilled that this great new practice owner in Texas is here. I don't know if she wants to say her name. So she's, she's new to what we do. You know, a practice that brings in $900,000 a year in credit card payments, it could be a $20,000 yearly cost. Um, Travis, you're in the know as much as anybody and you're on what, what, how have you seen your practices, whether they're yours or your, your coaching practices deal with the credit card chargebacks? So, I mean, if, so uh, an option for you, Todd, is if you want to avoid the financing fees, how about this, just raise your fees 10% and give people um, a no financing 10% discount. Therefore, the people financing mm. are paying you and the people not financing are getting a, kind of a benefit for just paying you. I mean, it, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. um, and so your normal patients are doing exactly what you want or paying you exactly what you want. The patients who need financing are paying you more in a way that doesn't make it sound like mm -hmm. more. Um, I mean, that's always the easiest way. Um, when it comes to credit card fees, personally, I just see that as a cost of doing business. I mean, it's 2%. Um, I would say that's one thing that you really want to focus on making sure you're not paying much more than 2%, 2.0, 2.1. Great. I mean, I've seen people paying three and 4% on their credit cards just because they have a lousy merchant service company. So uh, th there's a lot of, you know, it, there's a lot of things around that that people need to be aware of, but personally that 2%, even though I'm also taking a discount on my insurance fees too, I still think there's, just too much um, negativity right now in healthcare, passing that amount off to the patient. Now, I could be wrong I, I on that disagree. one, but I don't, I don't think don't it's disagree. worth the 2% to piss off even one patient in a hundred. It's just not worth it. Yeah, I don't disagree. I don't. I feel like that's like, you know, fee for service to the next level, right? Where you're like, now I'm not even taking your credit card. And like I said to my office manager, I was like, what about just taking checks? And she's like, yeah, no, we're not taking checks. She's like, that's... Because her concern is just people don't r run their bank accounts. The yeah, same one, bounce, one bounce checks destroys it. I do want to share and plug at this moment. So one of our sponsors, Merchant Advocate, Morgan, you drop it in the chat. If you guys text Merchant to 215-543-6454. One of my close friends three years ago got Merchant Advocate to redo his credit card processing fees and saves like $500 a month for three years. So he's like eighteen thousand dollars into savings. So what Travis said, and I think Todd, you use them because it was I do use them. Friend. I do. But what mm -hmm. Travis said was the point: make sure you are not getting taken advantage of by your credit card processing fees. Morgan will drop in the chat. You, it, it, this is actually a true thing. It's totally a free service. They save you money and take yep. a small piece and give you the rest. There's no cost. They, they, mm -hmm. This is one of these things where I think if you have Merchant Advocate run what you're doing, there's kind of no good answer and no bad answer because if they run what you're doing and say your credit card fees are good, 
they can't save you money. Well, you go, okay, I can't save you more money. But if they say they're bad, we can save you money. What it means is you've been leaking out dollars for many years prior to them doing it. So it's a, a really I've used them for over five years. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, so make sure those are the things that are key for practice owners. Good. We got another in the Q and a, we're really mo- cooking with grease here. Great. Do, do you give a cash discount? Can you, can you give a cash discount if you accept insurance? Now this is a good one for Travis. I've always been weirdly nervous about insurance contracts and laws. I know that's kind of a ambiguous question, but I think you know what they're getting at, Travis. If you're in network with insurance, what cautions do you need to take with other discounts? I will make sure I specify this. It has nothing to do whether you're in or out of network or fee for service. If you offer a cash discount, actually fee for service would work, but if you offer a cash discount to some patients and do not specify that you offer cash discount to your insurance patients, that is called insurance fraud. You're treating some patients differently than others. And it's not about the cash patients, all about what you put on the claim form. So do not do cash discounts. There's other discounts you can do that give you the same exact answer, but just do not do cash discounts because, and granted, are people going to get hit up with fraud? I mean, it's one in a million. Great. But the problem is, is if you get it hit up for anything else, it's about the first thing they look at because they know most offices falter on this one. An investigator looks at that. And if you're doing cash discounts or not doing them correctly, then a lot of times they'll just give up the investigation because they realize you're doing something that vast majority of offices aren't doing right. And they'll realize you're probably better off in the laws and they almost drop investigations from there. So it's just, it's not worth it. There's so many easier ways to do cash discounts that are legal and not fraudulent. Um, just don't do them. And one, I'm, we're allowed to celebrate our own sense of accomplishments. Like I want to share that Dennis Job Connect found someone, an associate in five days to cover for four months that had this practice of having a big problem. So I'm proud that Dennis Job Connect did that. There's a dentist out there being covered for, for a, a family emergency for four months because of Dennis Job Connect. And I'm proud of you too, Travis, because you've created an insurance program monthly. Mm-hmm. What does your monthly program do? I mean, even someone like Todd would benefit from it because mm-hmm. what this question just asked, when they text Travis and can, they can get 24-7 assistance, what does that look like? So I think that's the best part about the program is you can ask any question you want. You can send in any claim you want, and we'll get you the help or the answer that you need. Um, but there's also there's online training. There's Q&As. There's forums to use. There's uh, we do virtual Q&A sessions like this every month. Every one of them is recorded. So if you can't make the session, you can go listen to it later. And there's just so many resources on there for how to manage insurance well. And network out and network or fee for service. It's and what is this crazy? How to make your life easier. What is this crazy charge you charge people monthly for access to these answers? Twenty nine ninety five. Wait, so uh, twenty nine dollars and ninety five. <laughs> yeah, you have to specify. If I, get, if I could get twenty nine hundred dollars a month, that'd be awesome. But no, so I, for thirty dollars <laughs> a month, you can do that. Yeah. And for two ninety nine a year, get this for your office manager. Todd and I were having Chipotle on Friday. I'm walking home, and we we're talking about a service with. I mean, some of the services out there, they're just too good. Between the text and the emails and the things that you have at practice owners, take advantage of all the things you can do to decrease stress. And then, since I know you love photos, you can have get a free Todd uh, C course on photos, which is fantastic. <laughs> Let's keep going over. There's some questions. Oh, we got more in the pass, Q- right, oh, over, just pass right over that. What over what? No. Nah, what was what I missed? Oh, oh no, it's oh, the Wicked Witch of Dental Insurance. We got more in the Q and A. What is the best way to do a fee for service? Hold on, stop this. What is the best way to do a fee for service membership plan and still file insurance? I have some potential issues going on with the discount and also get the max reimbursement to the patient. I know this person well. He's awesome. We do not involve our membership clubs with insurances. I just don't involve them at all. People have dental insurance and want to use it. They are excluded from being in the membership club. It's a one one lane or the other. Here's the way to look at this. Your membership plan is there designed to try to get your patients to get off of insurance, to become a cash patient. The second you allow them to merge them, you've removed the number one reason for having a membership plan to begin with. Just don't do it. It, it's way too complex. It's not worth it. And honestly, what's the benefit? Most membership plans pay for hygiene visits. Hmm. Guess what dental insurance pays for? 
hygiene visits. I, I, I just don't see the point. I really don't. I, uh, I agree with you. It's just, it's too, too confusing. I want to, we'll go to the Q and A in a second. Common theme was getting, going more fee for service, Todd. Put the dentist aside for a second. What would you have your team training be? Where would you send your team? And really maybe even just to have more better discussions with patients about treatment plan acceptance and money in general. What have you done for your team to help them do that? I mean, you know, the slide I showed at the, at the course is it's, I have 10 places I've taken my team, you know, over 10 years to, to, to get all different ways to learn how to speak to patients and what sort of fits within our philosophy of practice. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I always keep talking about Paragon just because I thought they did a great job with my practice. And I thought their approach was very down to earth and they really involve your team in sort of decision-making processes and understanding what the numbers mean and holding them accountable for their performance and like keeping them vested. So like, I really thought that was great. I mean, I really think your stuff is good, Paul. You know how I feel Thanks. about it. I think that, I mean, I don't just say it to say it. I think any, every, your, all teams should come and see Paul lecture about verbal skills and, and, and speaking less weird and all the stuff yeah. that he touts, because I just think it's important to be aligned. I mean, you can, <laughs> I think the biggest thing, quite honestly, is you can take them wherever you want to take them and you can bring in whoever you want to bring in, but none of it's stuck until I started to act like a leader in the practice, right? And set my expectations with my team. And so that's, I think, the reason why we're bigger and better now than we've ever been is because I changed as a person in the practice and you need consultants to help you do that. I, I wasn't the type that understood how to lead a team early on. I had to be trained. Right. We've talked about this, Paul. Right. Yeah. We talk about the fact that we could train dentists who aren't as good at talking to patients as Travis and me and you are. And there's plenty of them out there. How to speak to patients. Yeah. Right. How to get treatment acceptance. Like it, it doesn't matter whether you watch the videos or not. I, that's what you're asking. You're asking, like, where do I learn how to speak to people if I'm not comfortable doing it on my own? Because dental school doesn't teach us. And treatment right? and acceptance goes from. Uh, you know, it's not just about giant cases. It's veneers, it's implant crowns. It's the stuff that makes your practice go. I mean, it's quadrant it. dentistry. I mean, let's not get it twisted. My bread and butter is still a section of dentistry, right? Yeah. Teaching patients how you can do more in a shorter period of time. It's still a single filling. I mean, yes. every time you ask for a single dollar from any patient, they're going to, some, a lot of them are going to push back somewhat. You've just got to learn how to deal with it. That's it. Any of the big course, any of the big courses that we talk about, right? All the same ones we tout, all the same ones we push all the time. Spear, Kois, all this. Mm -hmm. They all teach you how to speak. They all know yeah. that you can't do that kind of fee for service right. or any kind of dentistry unless you understand how to educate patients, sell patients, explain to patients, call it whatever you want to call it. And there was a great guy, a great young dentist today on the group said, I took these implant courses and I'm learning implants, but I don't know how to get anyone to say yes to implants. And I always say, do the reverse. Get people to say yes and refer to your specialist. Work on getting them to say yes and refer to your periodontist oral surgeon and restore it because sometimes you invest five, six figures in clinical training that a lot of times can just be wasted if you don't get to do it in the operatory because if you don't get to practice those skills, they go away. So really good points there. Um, Travis, do we need to bill patients for out-of-pocket amounts not covered by insurance? Do we need to bill patients for out-of-pocket services record. not covered by insurance? No, it, like when insurance pays and there's, there's money left over, my answer, usually this is yes, you have to, but I don't know. Like if on the claim form, you say you're going to charge a hundred dollars, insurance pays 70. Can you just forget about the other 30? No, that would be, well, let's specify here. It depends on the difference. So if the difference is between your fee and UCR, which is the insurance company's like random fee, um, that is an optional fee to collect. But if it's the, if it's a copay, meaning insurance is going to pay X percent, that's not a hundred, you must legally absolutely collect whatever that percentage is. So if they're going to pay 80, you have to collect 20, no questions asked. Yeah. I mean, also, and even this is a tie question. I know this, I'm so thrilled to have this young practice owner here with us. Really admire what she's doing. It's also just not a good practice to do that. I mean, it's like, why would you tell someone, and, and I know it's hard, but it just mismanages everyone's expectations, including your teams. I mean, I'm assuming you're Todd, like if you let people get away with stuff, your team notices it too. 
And, uh, oh, they, they, they give me the hardest time, of course, yeah. right? Because I'm the first one to devalue what we do because you feel bad, you wear your heart in your sleeve. I mean, listen, you hear a lot of stories. It's really challenging, right? But we also need to keep our businesses running. We're here to support our team. Team first is my mantra. And no, I mean, you have to, try. first of all, also value yourself. I mean, that's the hardest thing. You just, first and foremost, confidence in valuing yourself. And young dentists who think things go sideways and they probably think to themselves out of the kindness of their heart, you know what? You don't know copay, blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. not a good precedent to set. It's not a yeah. good precedent. Yeah. I would say that's the best thing is every time you're willing to give somebody a discount just across the board, it's devaluing what you do, the, pure and simple. It means your fee was either too high or uh, it means something along that ra- round. So or you're you not prepared to, to do the your ministry fees. you're doing. You know, yes, be, yes. be more prepared. That's the other thing. Don't do things that you can't do. That's, I mean, that's how you yep. get in trouble. I see it all the time when people come into my practice and it's a shame. They, everyone's a cowboy these days and we have to be very careful, very careful. And, and Here's the we, thing. Oh, right, Everybody's right. going to complain no matter how much you charge them. I mean, you could tell somebody a crown is $500. You can tell them it's $1,000. You can tell them it's $3,000. They're going to complain regardless that it's too much money. Just realize that they're complaining just because they have to pay out of pocket and it's not medical insurance that pays everything. So you've got to understand that you feel confident about whatever that fee is. I don't care if your fee is 700 or 7,000, you've got to feel comfortable with the number that you have. And if you're not comfortable with it, lower the number until you are so that you don't feel the need to constantly give stuff away. I mean, we charge less for our implants than the average in the area. It's not much less, but it's less because I feel comfortable telling patients we're less expensive than everybody around me. Great. It's because we do it all in house and it makes it really easy and simple. And we have a very predictable um, company that helps us with this. You know, does that sound good to you or not? And it sells a lot. Um, I would rather sell 20% more implants at a 10% discount. That's me because I like doing them. Um, But you just pick up whatever is valuable to you and just set your fee to where you're happy with it. And you always can tell patients to look them straight in the eye and go, that's the fee. It is what it is. I mean, there's there's so many good C words here and, you know, confusion is the killer case acceptance and consistency builds relationships. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, you see it with your friends, you see it with your family, you see it with your patients. Being consistent is just so key to building relationships. And then also, you know, we've all had patients I'll do very special things for people I have long-term relationships with. Someone's on their 10th implant and a tooth fractured and I feel bad for them. I might say, hey, this, this total cost for you this time is this, but that's on my terms, not on their demand mm-hmm. terms. Um, yes. Travis, do you use pre-authorizations with insurance at all? Or most of the time, do you feel like you know enough to proceed? So that's a very good question. Comes up with a controversial topic. For one, there's no such thing as pre-authorizations in dentistry, um, unless you're working with the VA. I'll throw that one out. Um, there's predeterminations, which only means the insurance company is giving you what the benefits are for that service, not that whether they pay for them or not, because they have to still run by the will mm-hmm. they accept the treatment. Um, so in general, I think they're a waste of time and you know effort. Um, because if you get a good breakdown from the insurance company, you can create just as good, if not better information than what you can get on a pre D. And in a lot of cases, crowns are a good example. There is so much more information that you won't know until you get in the case that you cannot send enough information or pre D to ever get them to pay for it. A fractured amalgam where you do not see it clearly on an x-ray, you will get denied as a pre D almost every single time. And you can almost every single time get them to pay for it, but you will not have the information until you start prepping the tooth. It just, I it's like that simple. That. Todd, how do you, you, you mentioned this in the lecture before, how do you deal with insurance processing and claims in your office with your patients as a fee-for-service dentist? We submit them the same way anybody else does, to be quite honest with you. They get, I mean, they get, they get the money, the patient, most of the time. I'm assuming. Correct. They typically, yes, yes. I would say 99% of the time they're getting their checks directly to them. They pay us at time of service with whatever arrangement we've just discussed, and then we submit their benefits. But, but boy, man, we talked about this. I mean, they want to get paid. It doesn't matter whether it's 300 bucks or 500 bucks. They, they want to get paid. And so every meeting, every monthly meeting, we still talk about getting a full-size PA, making sure you have the full root, if not a backup bite wing, have an intraoral picture. Everything Travis talked about, in fact, I was annoyed with my team afterwards, and I told them this because it was my own fault as a crummy leader that I let them leave. 
because I was like, oh, I'm done lecturing and I'm fee for service. This was, no, I mean, I'm very, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest and candid, right? I didn't really understand what Travis was going to teach us. And then as soon as I got there, I was like, that was a mistake. But right? you, 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 have you, the record, you have the Thanks recordings you. now. So, I mean, just the people watching this have purchased the recordings, but maybe they're encouraging a friend to do it. Maybe they want to buy it for someone for Festivus, my favorite holiday. Um, what, Todd, why will you, this is such a valuable point for me to bring out. You're going to have the recordings for free since you produce them. And you're going to say to your team, watch this. Why yeah. are you going to tell them to watch this when it's trash? Because it just it, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. It, it yeah. doesn't matter what you're knowledgeable about. The more you can talk to patients about what their benefit can achieve for them, the more service and hospitality my office is providing, which like I tout myself and I have to back it up. That's what I'm doing, right? That's the fee for service model typically, right? Is that you have to go above and beyond for your patient, whether it's clinically service, whatever. And so my team would benefit from understanding the, the tips and the tricks that Travis teaches because we're doing them all day long. We're having discussions about them almost on a monthly basis, if not daily basis, when writing on routers, take a PA, need intro oral pick, don't forget to document. I mean, I'm still writing narratives for my team. So I'm doing all the work. So right? what's, what I'm really just so pleased is to hear from a fever service dentist how important this is. And Travis, you heard Todd speak. Your team wasn't there, but what value would they derive from hearing a fee-for-service dentist, even though you guys are embraced the PPO world? Well, I mean, it's the relationship building. It's how to talk to people. I mean, if you're going to be fee-for-service, people expect more out of you, period. So if you can learn to offer that level of care, commitment, answers to questions, you can help yourself regardless of what type of participation. I mean, that's the thing that I think came out with the, you know, the entire group between the three of us is we pretty much do a lot of things the exact same way. We talk to patients yeah. the exact same way. We document the exact same way. You know, we sell the exact same way. I mean, it's none of those have anything to do with your insurance participation. It's just if you learn to do X better, you do better regardless. So I mean, that's, that's and I also think. Oh, Tra right, but right. Travis is so right. I'm sorry. Travis is so right about the why thing, right? And I wrote that about mm -hmm. my lecture too. It's like, who are you as a practitioner, right? Do you want to be like me and be on all the time and really, you know, have to have that kind of personality in your practice, which I find is very typical in fee for service because Travis knows himself and he's not, he doesn't want to do that, right? I know mm -hmm. myself and I'm a rambunctious type and I can take advantage of that in my business model, right? And so I really think it is about your personality a little bit. I do. I think that plays a big role in dentistry. And what, I, I love that one thing I want to bring to life because I have observed both of you. One theme that came out, you might not have noticed that both of you really don't want to have people on your team who don't want to be there. And both of you don't want to work with people who cause you grief every day. And it, that really has nothing to do with fee for service and PPO. I mean, Travis, you said that, you know, someone's not getting along on your team. They don't stay very long, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you'll, you have an office manager who even helps you invite them to find a new place or get on board with it, right? Yep. And Todd has a similar type person in his practice. And I just think while you're listening to this, and this is just such an important point, claims come and go, patients come and go, EBITDA comes and goes, P&Ls come and goes, but the people who you surround yourself every day with, there's just a, an enormous cost to that if they're not the people that you want to walk in and see. You don't all have to be best friends outside mm -hmm. the office, but I think that's really a common theme between both of you guys. And we Thanks, just... Man. My team last week went to the Texas State Fair just for the afternoon, just to hang out and have fun outside the office. Yeah. I think we spoke about the office like 10 minutes the whole time we were out. We were just hanging out to hang out. And it's good because these people, I mean, we don't tend to appreciate the fact that we spend almost more time with our team members than we do with our own families. I mean, you have to somewhat like them and get along with them <laughs> if that relationship's going to at all work out. And that's huge. I mean, you want to come to work and have as much fun as possible. Yes, it's to work, but you still have to have fun or work just sucks. Yeah. Um, I love what I do, but it's only because I like the people I work with. And they, I think, I, like I, me. Yeah, I couldn't imagine going in every day and working so hard to pay people salaries of people you don't like. Like yeah. that to me.
is, and that has to work on you mentally. See, you know, for me, it's all the psychology stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be held accountable for paying someone who I dislike their earning potential. That's wild, right? And so you that that doesn't work well in people's heads, whether you think you recognize it or not subconsciously. Yeah. Okay. And so you can't allow for it as a business owner. That's the problem. Well, and it like works it. both ways too. It's the if you get the feeling that somebody doesn't like you, oh. you probably need to start looking to replace them. Because if they don't like you, they don't respect you, and they're going to undermine you in some way, and they're not happy, which you do them a service, helping them out the door, finding somebody they can respect and like true. and enjoy so working true. for. It, it, it works both ways. And so. We're going to do a 10-minute lightning round. At the end, I want everyone to vote who won the battle, Clubber Lang Travis <laughs> or Rocky Todd. But right, could be a tie. So let's just do a fun 10 minute lightning round wrap. I do want to just deliver value to you guys. These are not just sponsors, but do great consults. If you want to find out about a fee negotiation or membership clubs, you can text in. We will text that back to you. I have other gifts before we go. But let's just do a few lightning round things. They don't affect what you do. You don't have to answer. This is one of my favorite people. He came to Boost. He's an awesome practice owner. Is there a case with any insurance that you know of, Travis? that will pay for a partial instead of a bridge. And you cannot collect the difference from the patient. The bridge is 3,000, the partial is 500. The patient cannot be asked to pay the 2,500. No. No. You, you sign a contract for the fee of the service you provided. It does not matter what insurance says, that is the fee that you collect for that service. If you did a bridge, you get paid for a bridge, period. This is the whole point of a downgrade. It is a very common misunderstanding. And it's because EOBs aren't often as clear as they could be. Um, but if you do a service, you get paid for that service, period. I like, I like that. That's probably another good reason to sign up for your monthly thing. Todd, whether you're fee for service, PPO, out of network, in dental school, 60 years old, why do you think taking more photos of some kind will make you a happier dentist, will increase treatment plan acceptance and decrease stress? I mean, take some photos of your work and come tell me what you, what you think. It's <laughs> eye-opening, dude. I mean, it, it makes you have to be self-reflective. That's a big part of it, number one. It also helps you plan a case. I mean, I can't look at a comprehensive case without having a set of photos in front of me. I reference them nonstop. And so if you want to do anything more than single units, and by the way, even if you want to do single units, because I don't know how you're doing single anterior units without photography, it's a service you're not clearly providing for your patients. It's below the standard of care. That's the other thing. Let's just put it out there, right? And so the reality of it is if you're doing certain cosmetic work or any kind of work in dentistry in general, you really need to understand how to, how to use a camera. I, I'll just, as a quick anecdote, today I, I broke out the intro. I have an intro camera every room. That should be standard for every practice across the board. It should be like having hand pieces. The fact that people even hum and haw about a thousand dollar intro or camera is beyond me, okay? Because all it does is sell things all day long. And I broke it, I break it out for every new patient experience. I do a tour and at the end I sit them up and I, we can go through all this at some point. But every time they go, well, that's a cool little gizmo. And I'll go to, yeah. to myself, an intraoral camera? Yeah. I was like, it's so like 1998. Like, what are you yeah. talking about? But people just don't know. So photos, mm -hmm. it is pic true. Pictures tell a thousand words and you can keep your jibber jabber less if you take more pictures. That's the whole point, the pictures and videos. I just want to share the show to plan your case is great, all that stuff. But also when you're talking to another patient about something you've done, you can say, Take a look at this before and after. Take a look at the video. You have the a beginning, portfolio. The be beginning. It's so videos wildly and photos valuable. Are, are so great. Um, yeah. Travis, how do you communicate with your team what needs to be attached to insurance submission? Like which x-rays to send? Do you submit them yourself? Do you mark the x-rays need to be attached? Tell us more about that. Um, most things my team's smart enough and has all the information they need to do it themselves. So, I mean, if we're going to do... I'm just trying to think of anything. If we're going to do a filling, they expect that at some point they may be asked for it. So we have it. We don't usually submit unless required. Um, SRPs, we all need, we always need bite wings and aperio charts um, and intraoral photos. They know that. That's just a standard across the board. Um, so a lot of things are just standards. The one thing I will say I take hands-on approach to is crowns and buildups because I often take four, five, six, eight pictures, which y'all saw in this, the um lecture, but I only send like two, three or four of them. And I narrow it down to the ones that are the most indicative of what I did. And I print those out. So 
that's the one thing I control. Everything else, there's a system for it. They do it automatically. But personally with crowns, it's because I take more than I need and I only want to send certain ones. So those are the ones that get sent. And that's usually on me to choose. Now, my assistants are usually good enough, probably nine times out of 10, they pick the exact ones I would have picked anyway. So great, they, they've learned, but it's because they've been with me for a while. Um, but that's the one thing I take a hands-on approach to. Awesome. Todd, anything on your end? You guys have similar things with you and your team? Yeah, I mean, I, I write down on the router, you know, IO picks taken, bite wing additional. You know, I tell my team when I'm paying attention, I mean, listen, we get into it all the time that we get into the mood and we forget, and that's a bad habit. So you need checklists and you need routines and you need consistency, right? But yeah, no, I try and give them all the information because it's coming back to me anyway if they don't have it, right? Because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, like Travel said, a buck stops with us, right? Why we do the crown? Yeah. So that's not their decision to make. It's our decision to make. Take some responsibility, right? Well, we did it because of a fracture, but you don't have a picture of it, Doc? Ooh. You know, it makes mm -hmm. it really, it's kind of silly, right? But that's on us. And listen, fee for service, I don't care if fee for service or insurance, you do a crown and patients don't get paid. You have some explaining to do because now why are you not driven by insurance? Now, I get away with that a lot more because I tell patients I'm not committed to what insurance tells me. We did this crown because I told you you needed it. That's the reason why we did it, right? And so I can sort of put my foot in the sand a little bit, but that can be off-putting for patients unless you have a strong relationship with them, right? New patients, you can't get away with that with as much. And so you have to be very careful. You do. I, I love that. Well, I'm, gonna leave I'm impressed. Todd, do you ever actually get a patient to realize, hey, we did this crown only because I told you and you needed it? Like, I, I don't know if I could ever get away with that line in particular. <laughs> I think so. I think at this point, I have a couple in my back pocket. I could probably okay. just be like, you, you need to do it. And they go, please, so do you, Travis. Who are you kidding? Yeah. I, I might have one or two. You have your own apples and, and uh, Jerry's yeah. there. Yeah, too, yeah. I'd much you... rather put a big picture on the screen and go, that's why we did it. I don't have to say a of thing. Course. They go look up and they go, ew. <laughs> I'm like, that's exactly why. And then they're well, like, that's our, those are our personality for. differences, that's Travis. That's question. for sure. <laughs> no, we'll do two minutes lightning round for the end for two things to leave you with. So one, this class two course breaks down how to do a class two and Todd, what is the value of learning that from Dr. Matt Costa? It's his course <laughs> telling you how to do a class two. Why because should he's, people watch that? Because he's, I mean, if I need a dentistry, then I go to Matt Costa. If yeah. anyone wants to, it should be enough said. I mean, because he's just, a, he's a renaissance man as a dentist, right? And he's also just clinically so sound and straightforward and appropriate. I mean, he's just a really nice guy too, but he just does very clean dentistry. His technique is unbelievable. And he makes it so that you just understand the concepts very cleanly and clearly, which is awesome. So that's just a great add to this at the end. And then the last part, which is about hiring an associate, all three of us have associate dentists. How come you couldn't live your best life without an associate dentist, Travis? What would prevent you? If you did not have an associate dentist, what wouldn't you be able to do? I would not be able to speak as often as I do now. I mean, I, I did some speaking before an associate, but I'd have to close the office and it was a hassle and my team complained and we could only do certain months and everything else. Now I can go pretty much whenever I want. And I, I'm pretty much somewhere every month. Um, so it, it, that was the biggest reason for me. Now, of course, that's not going to resonate with, you know, a vast majority of dentists, but it's the, you know, what's your goal? Is your goal to make more money? Is your goal to have more flexibility? Is your goal to be out of the office more? Figure out your goal and then make sure the associate aware, is aware of that. My associate, that she knows that's the reason that she's there is I want to be out of the office Thursday, Friday. So I can always do, you know, CE trips and things and work on CE courses and, you know, teaching people. Um, she loves it because she pretty much gets all the education I give anybody else because she's right there. Um, so find out your that's, why. That, like that's, about. that's your why. Todd, years ago, I saw Todd as an amazing dentist. I said, he needs an associate. He said, I don't need one. I said, he needs an associate. He said, I don't need one. And now he has not <laughs> one, but two associates. So your why is different, Todd, but not, not to say I did something great for you, more just to share with the, this audience now and in the future. What is adding an associate to your life? How has that made your with the life more fun, giving you more freedom? Tell our audience about that. Yeah, all the above. I mean, they're my two favorite days of the week now. I mean, there's no question about it. And I'm there with them. But it's nice to have other dentisting humans around you too. I, I practiced for 10 years by myself. And that can 
be stressful and to have support teams around you is lovely, especially if you're aligned philosophically and personality wise. And trust me, I'm not um, robotic, uh, uh, um, you know, Xeroxes of my two associates. That's for darn sure. But um, but we just have nice relationships that we're building slowly over time. And they're seeing the kind of work that we do out of the practice and the philosophy of practice that we have. And you get to share with them. Travis and I are teachers. We like to teach. So it's nice to teach your own associates. Yeah. But also, I mean, for me, it's qual- It's all everything I do is quality of life, <laughs> right? And so for me, like I can go away next week and be gone two days. And those days are very productive. My team still, you know, is all working. The practice is open. I'm providing a better service for my community. Uh, and I'm having more flexibility, which is wild, mm-hmm. right? It's fantastic. So that's so a There's challenges point. that come with any change in life. But two of the ones that you were not concerned about, but I think you were actually more concerned with people just want to see me and what am I going to say? And then, of course, uh, uh, there could be a stagnation of income or a cost. Those two are worth it, Todd. Having those conversations about why they have to see an associate, you're you're glad to handle those and get the benefit of having them. Listen, there's like Travis always says, right? There's going to be people who always bug you. People always won't pay you. People, there's always going to be people who only want to see Todd. Okay, good news. Mondays and Thursdays, you can see me, right? Like we have solutions to every problem in the practice, right? Mm-hmm. The, just like that young, young doctor spoke about earlier, how do I get you know, these people to pay me their co-pays at time of service as opposed to balance billing, right? Well, it's the same thing with my patients. When they show up to the practice one day and I'm not there and they lose it, which is happening, right? I will, I'll be honest, it happens. I can have a conversation with them because our relationships are so strong. Hey, guess what, Joan? Right. Good news here's a life hack. I'm there Mondays and Thursdays without anybody. If you want to be guaranteed to see me, that's what you do. And so there's solutions to every problem. You have to just be flexible and understand that at the end of the day, it's because patients have a relationship with me. It's hard to complain about that. Love that. Perfect ending. You guys did a great 60 minutes. I'm just going to ask for the video. My name is Dr. Paul Goodman. You can reach out to me at dentalnachos.com, paul at dentalnachos.com, Instagram at dentalnachos. Travis, if someone's listening to this 14 years from now and it has a million views and we're, you know, almost 60, right? Well, maybe you're a little younger than me. How can they reach out to you to find you, Travis? Dentalinsuranceguy.com is the easiest way to get a hold of me. And we're we're working on your Instagram, at Dental Insurance Guy. We're we're growing it bit by bit. I am, yes, a Facebook guy, but I'm starting to get into the Instagram thing, like the new kids. Yeah, and Todd, how about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm easy also. I'm at, I'm at Center City Philly Dentist, at Center City Philly Dentist, or doc at Center City Philly Dentist for email is my best and easiest way. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Um, really appreciate you guys sharing this with us. It was an amazing course. Get the recordings, watch them. Can't wait till we do the next one. How's next week? We'll, we'll come next week. Phillies will win the World Series by then. We'll celebrate the World <laughs> Series, Travis. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day. Thank you, Paul. Take awesome, it easy, guys. buddy. Thanks, All right. Guys. Have a good night, all. Bye.